everyone, and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some great videos to show you all this week. The way this is going to work is I'm going to show you all the latest and greatest videos from Jackson Hole taken by our eco tour guides throughout the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem this week. Then you'll have a chance to win a gift card for our trivia question of the week. And lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got any wildlife biology or naturalist related questions, go ahead and ask us in the comment section and I'll see if I can't get you some answers. Our moderator in the comment section this week is our EcoTour Adventures owner and guide Taylor. So everybody say hi to Taylor in the comment section. And I think it'd be great this week to start as always with grizzly bears. We had an amazing and exciting encounter with grizzly bear 610, the daughter of grizzly bear 399 out in Grand Teton National Park this week. Let's check in. Maddie, one of our naturalists here at EcoTour Adventures, had a great experience viewing grizzly bear 610 and her two two-year-old cubs this week out in the snow. Now, as you can see, grizzly bear 610, who is almost, um, her cubs are so big, they're almost the same size as she is, um, found a elk carcass, probably some gut piles left over from elk hunters that she and the cubs were feeding on in Grand Teton National Park. Now, for those of you who are not particularly familiar with all of our famous grizzlies here in Grand Teton National Park, grizzly bear 610 is 16 years old, and she's most famous for being one of the first cubs of the very famous grizzly bear 399. And uh, 610 was actually a part of a set of triplets that 399 had, uh, and each of those bears ended up going their own way as an adult. We'll get back to that in a minute, but 610 is most famous for being the only one of her female cubs who's then gone on to have cubs of her own. Now, grizzly bear 610 is one of my very, very favorite, if not most favorite grizzly bears in Grand Teton National Park. And that's because she is a grizzly bear. Sometimes 399 displays a remarkable tolerance of humans and human habituation. Grizzly bear 610 doesn't take any nonsense from anybody. She's known for not being terribly tolerant of people getting too close to her. She's known to being tough with her cubs and not hesitating to tell them who's boss. And she's known from time to time to bluff charge people when she feels like they might be threatening her cubs as a mother grizzly bear should be expected to do. All of these combined give her quite the reputation and it's part of the reason I love her. One of the things that makes grizzly bears amazing is that they're grizzly bears. They're not teddy bears. And grizzly bear 610 just ripping into this carcass out in the snow is a perfect example of what makes grizzly bears so special. They're a reminder to us that we're not the biggest, baddest things out there in this ecosystem. Now, the story of Grizzly Bear 399 and her cubs like 610 tells you a lot about the status of grizzly bear recovery in the lower 48 states. Grizzly bears were listed as an endangered species in the late 1970s and then downlisted to a threatened species, but are still listed on the Endangered Species Act. And that's because the starting population in the 1980s was likely less than 50 females in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so the vast majority of grizzly bears that we have in the Western United States are descended from a very small genetic pool. One of the concerns about removing grizzly bears from the endangered species list is that genetic inbreeding. And a really good example of how one bear can just make a tremendous difference is the vast number of cubs that 399 has had. Now typically adult grizzly bears can have about a 95% survival rate from year to year. Once they reach the age of four, they're pretty good at staying alive but cub mortality is very high, greater than 50% before the age of four years old. Now, grizzly bear cubs spend two years typically with their mother, and then they go through what's called a sub-adult phase for two years after that. And that's when they're most likely to get into contact with humans, get into garbage, cattle, bird feeders, and the like. It has been unfortunate that quite a few of grizzly bear 399's cubs have come into conflict with humans. Grizzly bear 610 seen here 
was actually part of a set of triplets that were born by her mother, Grizzly Bear 399. She's the only surviving member of those triplets, all born in 2006. Her sibling, 615, who was one of my favorite grizzlies I've ever known in Grand Teton National Park, was killed by a moose hunter who felt threatened by her, despite the fact that he shot her um, from behind as she was running away from him. And then her um, brother, 587, was killed for getting into cattle just outside Yellowstone National Park. And so Grizzly Bear 610 is kind of a living legacy of that original set of triplets that really marked the sign of bears recovering in Grand Teton National Park. When I was a little girl, we didn't have grizzly bears that were visible in Grand Teton. You could see them in Yellowstone National Park, but they hadn't been able to make their way far enough south to really recover in the Tetons. Grizzly Bear 399 was really the first truly successful mother to have multiple sets of cubs. And because of her roadside behavior, her um, familiarity and habituation to people and her willingness to come near roadsides to protect her cubs, she's become very famous as a result. For those of you guys who aren't terribly um, familiar with roadside bear behavior, some female bears will actually raise their cubs closer to people. And it's thought that there's two benefits to doing that. The first is that male bears will kill any grizzly bear cubs that they can find. And male bears, of course, don't like getting near people. And so the female bears, by being near roadsides, will actually increase the survivability of their young cubs because male bear mortality on cubs is one of the major causes of their death before the age of two. The second idea is that if other bears aren't utilizing roadside habitat, a female who brings her cubs to the roadside is going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the starchy bulbs and other plant material that grow nearby roadsides where there aren't trees or shade to cover those areas and where water and rain washing off the roads leads to more water and more irrigation of vegetation. And what we have is a desert climate. So Grizzly Bear 399 has these triplets, and they all make it to two years of age, which beats these unbelievable odds of that 50% typical mortality. Those cubs go on to live their lives and do quite well for a number of years. So that, that loss of two out of three of those cubs to adult circumstances is relatively unusual. 610 then goes on to have a series of cubs. The first couple sets of cubs she had were unsuccessful, which is not um, uncommon. New mothers are not going to be as good at raising cubs to two years, particularly with that mortality rate as old and established mothers. Then in 2015, I was so thrilled early in the spring, driving on the roadsides with my guests to see her on the side of the road with two young little itty bitty cubs. My hope was this was the time she was gonna be successful and she was gonna raise those cubs to adulthood. But I had no idea what was gonna happen next. And in fact, about a week later, Grizzly Bear 399 showed up with another set of triplets. And so if you're following 610's mother, that's her second set of triplets. Because remember, 610 was part of the first set of triplets. It is thought at the time that the odds of a grizzly bear having triplets were about one in 10,000. Now we know there's got to probably be a genetic component to this, or there's no way that grizzly bear 399 would have done so twice. So at this point, we're all a little bit concerned for Grizzly Bear 399. 610 is doing really well with her, ten, her twins, but 399 with those triplets, she was an old bear even back then. And we thought, boy, it was gonna be really hard for her to be successful being so old raising a set of triplets. We were all incredibly surprised then a month later to see what happened next. I remember clear as a bell that day in 2015, I was out with some guests in Northern Grand Teton National Park and I saw a bear with triplets and I pulled us off into a turnout and I put a spotting scope on them. And in those days, Grizzly Bear 399 had red ear tags and her daughter 610 had yellow ear tags. And I looked through the spotting scope and I realized, oh my goodness, this is a bear with yellow ear tags, meaning 610, who should have twins, but she's got three cubs with her. 
Then a couple days later, Grizzly Bear 399 with the red ear tags was seen with twins, and we realized that 610 had adopted one of her mother's cubs. Now, if you're following me, that means basically that 610 adopted what ended up being her own sister and raised her to adulthood as part of a set of triplets. Now, I was nervous because 610 had never really been successful raising cubs up until that point, but she did an amazing job. She raised all three of those cubs to adulthood uh, until they were out on their own. And at that point, she really secured her status as an amazing mother, just like her mother, 399. Now, grizzly bear 610 and her mother 399 do exhibit oftentimes very similar behavior. And they're oftentimes in the same area of the park at the same time, feeding on the same food resources. And this makes sense if you think about it, because 610 learned where to go from her mother. But it's very uncommon for a female grizzly to be tolerant of a younger grizzly in her territory. And the fact that 399 allows 610 to get as close to proximity as she does from time to time is proof in some people's eyes that she probably recognizes her own daughter. The fact that 610 was able to adopt one of 399's cubs is probably further proof that they definitely know who each other are. Okay, so back to the life history of Grizzly Bear 610. So she goes ahead and raises uh, two two-year-old cubs to adulthood in 2017, and then she just absolutely disappears for a solid two years. I was really, really concerned during those two years. I thought for sure that she was dead and she'd gotten herself in trouble that she couldn't get out of this time. And in fact, I was wrong. And we were all incredibly amazed when in 2019 she reappeared missing her yellow ear tags in fact she's still got a little scar where those ear tags used to be and she had two brand new little cubs and of course those two little itty bitty cubs that she reappeared with in 2019 are those big burly almost big as their mother cubs you see here I thought, oh my gosh, that's as good as it gets in the grizzly bear world to have grizzly bear 610 back on the scene, to have these great little twins. When of course this spring, her mother grizzly bear 399 showed up with quadruplets. If you put these two mothers together with all of the cubs they've raised, they've single-handedly almost repopulated Grand Teton National Park with grizzly bears. And they're really a great success story in the overall success story of grizzly bear recovery in the United States. The fact that we humans have learned to live side by side with this massive, unbelievably smart, unbelievably clever animal is a great testament to us as humankind and a great testament to the survivability of grizzly bears. And so I hope you all have enjoyed learning a little bit about some of the other members of 399's family, most famously Grizzly Bear 610, and you've had a great view of her and these cubs. I look forward to continuing to follow the story of this family. I look forward to seeing all of the great things, hopefully, that these two cubs will grow up to do after they're on their own next spring. And I thought it'd be fun to leave you with a classic Grizzly Bear 610 moment captured by our naturalist Maddie here as she teaches these cubs a lesson about who gets first food on this kill. Enjoy. to our ecotourist naturalist, Maddie, who spent most of the day with Grizzly Bear 610 and those cubs. Now, I do want to clarify, because I think it's incredibly important that we be clear. That was taken through a spotting scope from a whole lot more than 100 yards away from a vehicle. So I don't want anybody uh, to get the wrong idea. It's always important, and National Park Service policy, that you keep a distance of at least 100 yards away from any grizzly bear 
further away is certainly better and uh, you definitely want to do that even more so with Grizzly Bear 610. So I hope you guys have enjoyed learning a little bit more about 399's family. For those of you guys who are going to ask me about how 399 is doing, I will tell you that she is still outside of Grand Teton National Park right now feeding on those same elk gut piles that she saw 610 feeding on. Uh, during the elk hunting season, but she should start to make her way up into Grand Teton National Park hopefully soon because it's getting closer and closer to the time when she might start to think about migrating uh, northward towards her typical den site. But 399, of course, is really great. As many of you guys know who's watched, who've watched the show from week to week at surprising me and doing things that are unexpected. So we'll see if that's the case. But she and the cubs are just fine and they're in a pretty safe spot. Uh, but definitely, if you're in Jackson Hole, definitely keep an eye out on those roads and make sure that you're aware of wildlife that might be crossing no matter what species they are. All right, so that was pretty fun. I thought it might be fun to get one of our eco-tour naturalist favorites, Verlin, back in to talk a little bit about elk and the elk rut this week. Let's check in with him. Hey guys, Verlin here to talk about Jackson Hole and the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem's most populous large mammal. The elk. With the start of November, we can officially say the elk rut, or their breeding season, has come to an end. Bulls are currently in their post-rut period. This can also be thought of as recovery time from the rut. Bulls are no longer accompanying nor tending cows, and are either solitary or found in small groups with other males, which we call bachelor herds. Even though the elk rut has officially come to an end here in Jackson Hole in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, over the last several weeks, our guides have captured loads of fantastic elk rut action. Let's take a look back over one of our favorite seasons here in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, the elk rut. One of the telltale signs of fall here in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem is the sound of bugling elk. This usually occurs right around or just after the fall equinox each year. The day is getting shorter, the night's cooler, and the elk are getting ready to breed. The start of the rut is dictated by when the first cows enter their estrus cycle. Um, estrus is the time when they're willing and responsive to breeding with males. But what isn't understood is to what triggers the first cows to enter estrus. Uh, many believe it is triggered by a photosensitive response, as most cows enter their first estrus cycle within 7 to 10 days of the fall equinox each year. Uh, that would be the period in time when the days are shorter. We're starting to get under 12 hours of light a day, hence photosensitive response by the females. We don't really know, just an idea. So generally when the cows are in estrus, at least the bulk of them, that, that first rut takes place, and that's when the males are most actively displaying um, their tending harems, keeping other males at bay, those satellite bulls that, that might want to get in on the rut action as well. So bugling, they're active, and uh, by the end of September, we usually see that activity slow down a lot. And that's because just like with other ungulates um, or hoofed animals, mammals, uh, the females actually have two estrus cycles. So not every cow will be bred during the first estrus cycle, which would be during our peak rut here, which would be mid to late September, um, there's a several window gap there where you know, we see less activity, but as females that weren't bred initially during their first estrus cycle move into their second estrus cycle, the show continues and things pick back up, usually in mid-October, early mid-October, and some of that activity even taking place into late October. So the elk rut is uh, quite a long period here, about a month and a half in total. And it's my personal favorite time to be in the Jacksonville area. Well, heck, anywhere with elk for that matter. As I mentioned earlier, we are currently in the post-rut cycle. So the males are done breeding. Most of the females have hopefully been bred. And they're in recovery mode. They've been busy over the last month, if not longer, fighting other males tending harems, chasing cows, bugling, doing all those exciting things we love to see during the rut. But uh, they're so busy that in fact some males uh, or bull elk will lose upwards of 30% of their body mass uh, over the rut periods. And this recovery time is extremely important for them. 
the next stage uh, in, in the elk movements here in the valley and another really exciting time to be here is the winter migration. So this post rut cycle or period is going to last until we start to see more snowfall and accumulation in the high country, inevitably pushing elk down into the valley. And hopefully within the next month or so, we get some weather and we get to start to see the National Elk Refuge and other areas of Jackson Hole fill with elk. Uh, that's another magical time to be here. All right, guys, take care. So a big thanks to Verlin who helped us out with that footage, as well as quite a few of our other guides. Taylor, who of course is in the comments section, Laura, Sailor, Laura, Sarah Ernst, Tyler, and Jason all contributed footage to that particular segment. So I took a look at where everybody is watching from this week. If you haven't checked in yet, please do tell us. I think our furthest away this week um, is Bobby again, who I'm cheating because he told us last week where he was from, so I didn't just know this flag off the top of my head, but Guyana in South America. So Bobby, thank you so much for tuning in. If anybody is watching from farther away, we'd love to see if we can't beat that, although I think that's going to be our winner this week. But I'd love to know if you're watching from Teton County, Idaho, or from Bozeman, Montana, or even Teton County, Wyoming. Uh, it's great to see everybody who tunes in this week. And a big reminder, if you're enjoying our broadcast, of course, to go ahead and uh, like and share this broadcast because that helps us spread our reach. And we do want to provide this awesome educational content for everyone. All right, so let's tune in next with an animal sometimes um, very misunderstood and misappreciated, but one of the really, really coolest animals in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, the coyote. Hello everyone, Mike Vanyan here. And on a day like today, where there's a 70% chance of snow for the next six months, I find myself cuddled up next to a warm and cozy fire, dreaming of the dog days of Indian summer, where the golden grass still glowed in the lazy afternoon sun. And when I'm talking dog days, of course, I'm talking Canis latrans, the North American coyote. Latrans, of course, Canis latrans in Latin means barking dog, where they have the widest vocal range of any North American mammal, with over 11 vocal tones. They can make woofs, huffs, barks, barking howls that all deliver threats or sound an alarm, prompting pups to retreat to the safety of the den. Yelping or low-pitched whines mean submission. Now, coyotes mate for life, and historically, that is pretty rare for North American mammals, where most are deadbeat dads. Historically, coyotes are known as a trickster, and they were praised for military might by the ancients. Today, they are associated with cowardice and betrayal. Here in Jackson, our coyotes have light gray fur with dark patches. Down south, they have lighter red fur with lighter patches and bristle-like fur. Our population here in, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem of coyotes has dropped some 40% since the reintroduction of the wolf in 95, 96, and 97, because they are preyed upon by wolves, but also cougars, lynxes, eagles, and even alligators in their southern climes. The coyote is the most common carrier of disease and parasite amongst North American predators, where they can carry rabies, distemper, hepatitis, encephalitis, tularemia, mange, ticks, fleas, and fluke infection. Now, only about 10% of coyote pups actually reach maturity. And the coyote is the most persecuted predator in all the United States. However, they have outwitted us all. While the federal government kills some 80,000 a year, and humans kill, on average, over 1 million per year, the coyote, native only to the western two-thirds of the United States, is now in every state except Hawaii and they are poised to break through the Panama Canal and enter South America in the near future. In the wild, coyotes live up to 14 years. In captivity, over 20 years. And come to find out, coyotes can tiptoe, which is news to me. Contrary to popular belief, the coyote actually runs faster than the roadrunner. 
uh, some 43 miles an hour. And they run with their tails down, as opposed to your dog, which would run with its tail up, and wolves, which run with their ta tails straight out. Something I found out recently is that coyotes actually eat porcupines using one member of their pack to distract the porcupine while the other one sneaks around and flips it over to avoid getting pricked by those 30,000 quills. Well, I wanted to thank you all and uh, see you next summer. So a big thanks to Mike for that look at coyotes. Now, full disclosure, guys, that video was taken um, not this week. I think it was maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. Uh, Mike was out of town for a little bit, and he's gone south for the winter to spend a little bit of time with his family. So we'll see him next summer. But he was getting me uh, a little bit of that. A little bit later, we do have snow on the ground, so I didn't want you guys to get the wrong idea. But that's such some great views of coyotes. We thought you might enjoy seeing it. Uh, anyway and of course we want to be perfectly honest because almost always the footage that we're showing you has been taken this week in jackson hole or yellowstone we'll always tell you if that's not the case so that's pretty fun that's what we've got for this week it's been such a pleasure showing you some of these videos and now it's time for my second favorite part um, of the program which is our trivia question of the week is everybody ready to answer our trivia question so guys the way this is gonna work is we started our trivia um, Sorry, we started uh, our online store, which Taylor will give us a link to in just a second here, uh, during the first outbreak of COVID as a way to pay for our employee and guide's health insurance. So if you'd like to support EcoTour, particularly the EcoTour employees who are giving you this interpretation every week, we'd love you for you to check out the online store. There's all sorts of cool stuff in there. We put a bunch of brand new stuff in in the last week. So if you haven't tuned in recently, it's well worth going in there. This week's sponsored item uh, is is these awesome hats made by naturalist Elise Tonelli, uh, one of our great naturalists here uh, at EcoTour Adventures. And she makes these really, really cool bear hats. So if you want to sport a little bit of $3.99 or $6.10, definitely check these out. They're pretty awesome. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan for sure. I uh, definitely love these. I'm looking forward to wearing one all winter long. As soon as I saw the first of one, I had to get one for myself. What do you guys think? Pretty good, right? Um, so definitely check those out. As for um, our trivia question of the week, the way this is going to work, all you have to do to be entered to win our $10 gift card to the store is to answer the question correctly in the comments, and then you'll be entered in a random drawing to win. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about last week's question, which you can answer in the comment section if you want, but that won't win you the, won't win you the card. And then we'll go ahead and we'll ask this week's question. So last week's question uh, was brought to us by our quiz master, Sarah Ernst. And uh, she, she took this uh, still on her game camera and she just recently went out before the snow got too deep and downloaded all of those pictures to her computer and got this great view of this bear and cubs. You can see it was taken on the 4th of July this year. Her question was, are these black bears or are they grizzly bears? So remember, when you're trying to tell the difference between black bears and grizzly bears, you want to look at the size of the ears. Grizzly bears have ears that are almost hidden in their fur, except for maybe cubs. You want to look at the, the muzzle, so grizzly bears are going to have sort of long, elongated muzzles, think a little bit like a dog muzzle, and black bears are going to have a Roman nose, so it's kind of flattened and a little bit more squat, right? Definitely going to want to look for that. And then, of course, the presence or absence of a hump could be a great way to confirm. Now, remember, the one thing you don't want to do, as we've talked about before on this broadcast, is use size or color to differentiate between the two species. So go ahead and tell me in the comment section which one you think it is, and I will go ahead and reveal that this is a mother black bear and cub. So if you guessed black bear, you got that correctly. Elise, who actually is the person who informs everybody of their winner who wins every week, has uh, gone ahead and given out the winner for that particular prize. Um, almost enough to get one of these hats. 
actually, if you want one. Uh, but if you want to win this week, here is this week's question brought to us by Elise, who actually came up with this one. Guys, I decided to outsource a little bit of my trivia because my trivia questions were too easy, as Don likes to tell me. Uh, so long story short, hopefully some of these, you guys are finding them a little bit more difficult. Let us know how we've done. But I, um, I found this great uh, depiction in the Library of Commerce, uh, Library of Congress of Theodore Roosevelt at Thanksgiving with all these guys to illustrate this. And our question of the week is, what animal's diet, who lives here in Jackson Hole, is made up primarily of elk? What animal's diet is made up primarily of elk? So 85% of their summer diet and between 90 and 95% of their winter diet. If you know the answer, go ahead and tell us in the comment section. And one of you guys will be entered to win that gift card. And I do have to tell you guys, last week we featured Taylor's um, image of Grizzly Bear 399 and Cubs, because we were talking about 399 so much last week, so it made sense to do. And oh my gosh, you guys, you bought it out. Um, we still have plenty more available, but definitely, uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out that print, it's really, really cool. Uh, and there's also a Mangelson print of 399 and triplets um, from the last set of triplets that's up on the website as well. So definitely check that out. Remember, one of those triplets is one of the sets that Grizzly Bear 610, if you've been watching us from the beginning of this broadcast, actually adopted. So there you go, a little bit of history for you guys. Go ahead and let us know in the comments section what the answer to this week's trivia question is. All right, so once we've done that, that brings us to my favorite part that we get to every week of our broadcast, which is I'm here to answer your questions live. So if you've got a question for me, go ahead and ask in the comment section. Now you'll see me looking down and that's because I've got my iPad here that I'm looking at um, your questions. So give me a chance to sort of take a look at them and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. All right, lots of answers on the trivia question. Pretty awesome. Looks like maybe I made it maybe a little bit easy. Gosh, uh, not the first time, I guess. <laughs> I gotta stump you guys a little bit harder, my gosh. Um, you guys just, you're too smart. You're too cool for school, I guess. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna start from the top here. Um, Don is asking, what is the sex or gender of Grizzly Bear 610's cubs? Uh, we don't know. They're too young. So the only way to really be sure of the gender of grizzly bear or black bear or even mountain lion young is to sedate them and take a look, so to speak. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that unless it was absolutely necessary. And so obviously we have not done so with grizzly bear 610's cubs. There is some theories out there about cub genders being able to be tell, being able to tell from uh, a young age. I will tell you one of Grizzly Bear Six Sense Cubs is very precocious and likes to um, venture pretty far away from her mother or his mother. Uh, and the other one likes to stay pretty close. There is one that she is constantly having to discipline and uh, tell to behave who's given a lot of sass. And there's another one who definitely is not that way at all. That could just be personality, right? Some animals are born more alpha and some animals are born more submissive. But it also, there is a theory out there that I'm just going to put out there because there's no way to prove it one way or another, that some people think that cubs that are more independent oftentimes turn out to be male and cubs that spend a lot more time at the older age before they're on their own. So like now up until the spring, being disciplined and constantly testing the patience of their mother are more often male, but there isn't great research to back that up. So take of it what you will. I will tell you, she's constantly disciplining one of them. If it ends up being one male and one female, that would certainly be suggestive, but we've certainly had suggestive cases in the past. There are plenty of female grizzlies out there who have quite a bit of sass. Grizzly bear 610 would be the penultimate example. Uh, and when 
Grizzly Bear 399 had that set of triplets, of which 610 was, there was one bear that was constantly lagging behind the other two. Much like, uh, by the way, Grizzly Bear 399, who has quadruplets right now, has one cub that's constantly lagging behind. That might just be how bears behave, or it may have been that Grizzly Bear 610 was the one lagging, but she did have a brother in that litter. So kind of hard to say, really good question. I hope my answer made sense there because I was kind of going all over the place, but the short version is we don't know. There's a theory that certain cubs may behave differently when they're male versus female. All right, so excellent. Thank you very much, Don, for that. Susan asks, will they eat the bones? Will 610 and the cubs eat the bones? They won't eat the bones, but they'll eat the marrow. So they will crack the bones and then eat the interior. The bone marrow is an incredibly nutritious food source and certainly an option open to them. They're definitely going to get the easy to reach stuff first. Um, they're going to get all those meat pieces off before they move on to things like marrow. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, because it's easier, but number two, because they've got to get to it before those birds do. Uh, quite a few guys were asking about those black and white and green birds that were showing themselves. And um, those are black-billed magpies. There are also some ravens out there that she was chasing off a few times in that video. Those guys can stash up to a pound of food a day. And so grizzly bears will oftentimes bury their food, um, as you guys may have seen in this broadcast in the past, to protect it from those scavenging birds. But another thing to do is to try to get all the available meat first before getting into the marrow, which the ravens and magpies can't reach. So really good question. Do grizzlies climb trees like black bears do? They can, they're perfectly capable of it, but black bears are built for tree climbing and grizzly bears are not. So it's all about their claw shape. Grizzly bears have these long, narrow claws that aren't particularly sharp uh, and they're built for digging. They're built for digging up food. Remember, 80% um, of a grizzly bear's diet is vegetation, the average grizzly bear. So they need to be able to dig up starchy bulbs and roots. A black bear has claws that are hooked, almost like a, a tree hook, uh, so that they can easily get up trees. Uh, it's much harder for a grizzly. Cubs are certainly better at it than adults are for the very simple reason of their claws aren't as long, but also because it's a great strategy to protect them from things like male bears who'd have a much harder time getting up a tree. I certainly have seen grizzlies pretty darn far up in trees. Um, in fact, I've seen both 399s and 610s cubs way, way up in trees, and I've seen 610 get way high in a tree, but they don't have the agility uh, that a black bear does. So that old myth that if you find yourself um, in conflict with a bear, you should climb a tree. Probably not. Not if you have other alternatives, at least. Um, Stephen Herrero in his great book, and I know it's got a gory title, but it's a very interesting read, Grizzly Bear, I'm sorry, Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance, addresses that at some length. And basically, long story short, a tree isn't going to do you much good because both species could climb trees. Far better to make noise in the woods, make sure bears are aware of where you are, carry bear spray, and be prepared when in bear country than to ever put yourself in that kind of situation. So great question. Ah, how do you know if it was 610 if it didn't have a yellow tag? I will acknowledge, boy, it was easier. <laughs> so when Grizzly Bear 399 had those red ear tags and Grizzly Bear 610 had the yellow, uh, that was helpful. Although I will say her sibling 615 at the time also had yellow ear tags and it wasn't always that easy to tell them apart. Uh, there's a couple things that tell us that that's Grizzly Bear 610. Uh, the first and most obvious is there's only a couple female grizzlies that use Grand Teton National Park that have cubs that are that age, that have two cubs that are in their second year. So that's that's a big indicator. Of all the roadside bears, bears that oftentimes will be more near human areas, she's the only one currently that has cubs that age of, that she has two of. So that can make it kind of easy, um, or at least give you a suspicion. There's a couple other things about 610 that can make it um, more obvious. She's pretty large for a female bear. She's got a small scar underneath her right eye that can provide some degree of verification. And she's got a little bit of a, her left ear missing from where that ear tag was when she removed it. And so if you really, really, really wanna make sure, can be a little hard to tell in the field, but you can take a look at a photo later sometimes and see those indicators. So great question, um, but yeah, no debate on our end that that's Grizzly Bear 610 and her cubs for the very simple reason of 
that's the only bear around who fits those characteristics. It's not always clear. And we're always very careful here when we're not sure. Uh, it's very sometimes common for bear watchers to jump to conclusions that this bear is this bear and this bear is that bear. Um, first of all, I think it's really important that we not anthropomorphize grizzly bears, right? Give them human characteristics and traits because what's cool about them is that they're grizzly bears, right? That they're not humans. That's why we're very careful to keep them with numbers and not names. And then the second thing, of course, is that while they all have individual personalities and preferences, um, at the end of the day, it can be easy to, uh, particularly lone bears, not be clear which is which, for sure. So um, in this case, we're pretty confident in our diagnosis, but if we're not confident, we're always gonna be sure to tell you that. Um, so great question, that's perfect. Let's see here. Susan asks, when will they shed antlers, those elk? So the bull elk are gonna, so first of all, antlers, the very nature of antlers is their bony projections from the head that branch or prong and are shed every year. That's what an antler does. A horn like a bison may have or a bighorn sheep is gonna continue to grow throughout their life. And usually males and females will have them. An antler usually only males have. There are a couple exceptions one of which are caribou and reindeer. But elk, just the males have those antlers and they're gonna go ahead and shed them after January. Um, the, the big bulls are gonna shed their antlers first and then the younger bulls are gonna shed their antlers later. So depending on how big your set is, is kind of how soon you shed them. Um, and they're, um, by the time we roll around to March, everybody will have lost their antlers, but it's kind of a gradual process. Now sort of side note, because it's that time of year, and I always like to bring this up. Both male and female reindeer have antlers. The males, actually, in the case of both caribou and reindeer, do shed their antlers before December in that species. Um, every depiction I've ever seen of Santa's reindeer, they have antlers, which is strongly suggestive that Santa's reindeer might be female. Just throwing it out there. Or maybe the artist who depicted them wasn't necessarily getting it right. Uh, but Rudolph, Rudolph could be a girl. Just something to think about. All right, thank you very much for that. Bill asks, when will 399's cubs come of age? How will 399 disperse the cubs? Well, they will be grown next spring. They'll go into hibernation. I'm sorry, 610's cubs will be grown next spring. They'll go into hibernation and they'll be on their own come spring. 399's cubs sorry for the confusion, will go into hibernation, come out and spend another summer, spring, summer, and fall with her, go into hibernation again, and then they'll be on their own. Traditionally, the way that's done, it can vary, vary a little bit. Um, by the spring of their, uh, their year of maturity, so to speak, their subadulthood, the females oftentimes will be a little bit more pushy and they'll be, you know, go find your own food, give me some space. But oftentimes the deciding factor is spring, May is breeding season for grizzly bears and black bears in this area. And the male bears will oftentimes push the cubs away from the mother so that they can breed again with that mother. So it's usually a case of them being driven off by a male bear um, although not always, it can certainly be otherwise. And sometimes those females are reluctant to let their offspring uh, fledge, so to speak. So kind of an interesting thing to watch for sure. Uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. And then those cubs will sort of spend, well, now sub-adults, will spend the next two years kind of wandering around, oftentimes on less preferable territory, um, on the boundaries of better habitat because big bears are going to occupy the best range. And that's oftentimes why they can get themselves into a little bit of trouble, a lack of knowledge, a lack of wisdom, and a lack of the best habitat. So yeah, we've got another great year, hopefully, with 399 and any cubs she may be able to rear to adulthood. So great question. Mark asks, are coyotes crepuscular like wolves? Mark, way to give the cool science word of the day. So crepuscular for all of you guys who are going, who the what now? It's one of my favorite words. It's basically Latin for dawn and dusk. It means an animal who's most active right before and after dawn and right before and after dusk. Most mammals in the Western United States are gonna display crepuscular behavior where they're going to have their greatest periods of activity in the coolest parts of the day uh, right at dawn and dusk. And so sometimes when people come out and see us in August when it can be quite warm and they say to me, I've been looking for a moose for a week and I couldn't find one. And I'll say to them, well, 
when were you looking? And they'll say, oh, around noon. Well, of course, that's going to be very hard on a moose to be out in the heat of the day. And so you have to get up early or stay out late uh, to see a lot of our mammal species. And the answer is yes, in the summer, spring, summer, fall, coyotes are absolutely crepuscular. Um, and in the winter, most mammals in Jackson Hole prefer the morning and evening hours, but can be active throughout the day. The cooler temperatures are going to go ahead and allow them to have more movement and activity that the summer hours and heat would not. So very much, very much, thank you very much for that question. That's a great one. Let's see here. Susan asks, how did the refuge get started? Susan, that's going to be a great episode, I think, one of these upcoming weeks where we're going to talk a little bit about the National Elk Refuge as we get into the winter and the elk really start to gather there. It'll be more important to talk about that because we're going to have more and more sightings throughout the winter that you're going to see there. Uh, the very short version is it's one of the first national refuges created in the United States and it was created after a really, really difficult winter. Uh, combined with cattle grazing their native forage and grasslands caused a large mortality event of elk. And we lost the vast majority of elk in Jackson Hole um, due to a lot of different factors, but in part the work of Stephen Leak, who was able to photograph this and send these photographs to folks out on the East Coast who were able to publish them in newspapers. There was a great outcry and a demand that... Um, the president and the Congress create a refuge for these elk so that they'd have a place to live. Uh, so 1912, the National Elk Refuge was created. One of the um, first major refuges created for a large mammal. Prior to that, we'd had a couple other national refuges created on sort of offshore islands for nesting birds. But the National Elk Refuge was really the first of its kind. And it's a pretty fascinating landscape. Um, you know, there's so much we've talked about when it comes to Grand Teton and Yellowstone, and they are unique and special. Um, but the National Elk Refuge is really unique and special as well. So we'll get more to that as we have more going on there. Great question for sure, and we'll definitely come back to it. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Barb asks, how do the grizzlies get their names or numbers? Barb, that's a great question. Not all bears do. That is their research number. So those animals that we're talking about that have numbers have received um, some level of research. Usually they've been sedated and a collar or ear tags has been placed on them. That's either because of population monitoring studies. We're trying very hard to understand how many grizzly bears there are and how they move around so that we can best conserve them so we can get them off the endangered species list. And also if they've gotten themselves into conflict with people. In the case of grizzly bear 389, she got her research number after when she was uh, a young bear, she got into the garbage behind Jackson Lake Lodge. The process of sedation and radio collaring and tagging was a negative enough experience from her. She cleaned up her act and she has not gotten into garbage since. Uh, kind of a negative reinforcement. Grizzly Bear 399 did get into some conflict with people, including swiping a guy who got too close to her carcass many years ago when 610 was one of her cubs. At the time, uh, the rule was bear touches person, bear dies. And we were all pretty upset about this. We thought that 399 would be euthanized for her behavior. But the Park Service decided that she was acting like a grizzly bear should. And uh, she was guarding her carcass and her cubs in an area that uh, humans should not have been in. And long story short, they went ahead and they decided to let her continue to live. But all of her cubs got research numbers to be on the safe side at that point when they became subadults. Uh, so they were uh, trapped and they got those yellow ear tags. At the time, it was sort of a running joke because it was back when we still had the, the terror alert levels after September 11th. And we joked that Grizzly Bear 399, which was the only bear who'd ever been allowed to continue living after touching a human, was terror alert red, right? She had the red ear tags. And her cubs who had witnessed the behavior were terror alert level yellow, right? Because they had seen this sort of thing. Obviously, since then, Grizzly Bear 610 has kept her nose clean, uh, as has 399. She does occasionally bluff charge people who get too close or get in her face. Um, but that's what any grizzly bear would do if you go stick a, you know, a camera up her nose. That's why we've got rules about keeping your distance from bears. Uh, and so it's uh, over a number of years the decision was made. We didn't need to continue to have a collar on 399 anymore and we didn't need to have one on 610 either. And as both of them got those ear tags off, they have not been replaced. Um, so great question.
Karen asks, are there magpies that also have blue, white, and black feathers? So um, there's quite a few different kinds of magpies throughout the world, but what's interesting is that uh, they're all white and black, and then most of them have splashes of what you would think of as either blue, green, or black. And it's really cool that that feather uh, that looks blue in that video, or sometimes green, is actually reflective. So blue is actually a very rare color in the natural world. We don't actually see a lot of blue typically. Um, there are animals and birds that are truly blue. A bluebird is truly blue. Um, and there are animals that are truly red. A cardinal, for instance, would be truly red. But a ruby-throated hummingbird, um, if you actually looked really closely at the feathers on a ruby-throated hummingbird, you'd see those feathers are actually black and they're reflecting the light. And um, as that light reflects back to your eyes, it appears red. It's kind of neat. Same thing's going on with magpies. They are reflecting light. Uh, those feathers are actually black, but depending on how they reflect the light and how the sun is in the sky and whether it's overcast or sunny, they may appear, those feathers may appear blue or green. Basically, it's much more easy to create reflective feathers than it is to create truly blue feathers. And so a lot of animals who have blue, uh, particularly duck members, animals in the duck family and some of these others are actually reflectively blue. And a lot of the animals that are red are using that same characteristic. So a um, lot of hummingbirds use reflectivity for all of their colors, green, red, blue, you name it. And magpies are using that same practice. So kind of cool. That's why they can sort of seem different colors uh, in different times. Let's see here. Molly, you're asking a really, really good question, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell you off the top of my head. Taylor may know, and he may answer in the comment section as well. I'm going to see if I can't think about this. Um, so the first set of cubs that 399 had that was really out in the public that I got a chance to see, because prior to that, she was not a roadside bear. Uh, there was one male in that litter. Um, and then her next litter had uh one male and then so we were at two and then she had another cub uh, another set of cubs uh both who died before we were able to learn the gender but they could have been male so hard to say one was hit by a car the other one was separated and did not make it um and then there might have been another set of cubs in, in the middle there but i don't think so then we had our second round of triplets um of those triplets one of whom was raised by 610 uh, one of those cubs was male, so we're at least four now. Um, and then she just had a set of twins that she set off on her own. Those we did not know the gender on yet. Um, they're probably going to get their research tags pretty soon, and at that point we'll know the gender. But we're not sure necessarily what the gender is. So there could have been a male there, and there could be males in her current set of quadruplets. So a short answer would be at least four, but maybe uh, as high as seven. Uh, not counting her current cubs. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Taylor, we'll see if he can't check my math and we get that one right. Uh, that's a great question. I, I can maybe do a little research, get back to you, but we may just not know. As you can tell, uh, we don't always necessarily know the cubs maybe don't live long enough or they never get research tags and so we don't find out. So great question. Let's see here. Don, this is a great question. And once again, I'm going to have to give an opinion. What animal is the best eyesight, best hearing? Uh, great gray owl comes to mind. That sounds like a pretty good candidate to me. Um, foxes have amazing hearing. So that might be one. Um, eyesight wise, anything in the raptor family. So Swainson's hawks, red-tailed hawks, northern harriers, bald eagles, they're all going to have pretty amazing eyesight. Pronghorn can see the... Um, rings of Saturn and moons of Jupiter with their bare eye. So probably the best vision for sure of any of the mammals. Um, and then I guess with the mammals, I'm going to go with fox. And then with birds, it's a little bit of a wash. But something in the raptor group, one of the owls or hawks probably. So great, great question. Let's see here. <laughs> Oh, I love this. Thanksgiving's next week. Are there wild turkeys in your area? We do not have wild turkeys in Jackson Hole, but we do have them just to the south and east of us. Um, some of our turkey populations in Wyoming, I, sus I think, are introduced, but, um, you know, turkeys went through a pretty serious extinction period um, in the 1940s and came back from sort of the brink of extinction in the United States, particularly in this 
in the Midwest, uh, sort of through the 40s and 50s. And that was mostly through introduction. So I'm not sure where turkeys are necessarily native in Wyoming, but we do definitely have them here and in Idaho, but not in Jackson Hole. I think there's too many predators who would find them a tasty snack. A coyote probably would think they're pretty great. Great question. One of 399's cubs had a hurt foot. Is this cub doing better now? Uh, there's still occasional limping from that cub, but um, everybody who I've talked to who's a real expert uh, feels that it will not be a permanent condition for that cub. So short version is it's drastically improved, may disappear. Uh, if it doesn't, won't affect their long-term ability to hunt and survive. So great question there. Let's see here. Three ninety nine is getting up in age. How long will she continue to breed? So uh, humans are the only mammals that go through menopause. Any other uh, female mammal is fertile till the day they die. If there's any degree of infertility, it's more often in the males as they get older than the females. Menopause is a uniquely human condition. Uh, we can go into the evolution of why that is maybe another time, but I find it fascinating. So long story short, she is fertile up until the day she dies. Uh, grizzly bears in the wild tend to not get much older than she does, mostly because their teeth just wear down and they're not able to effectively ingest nutrition. So we know she's reaching the end of her lifespan. Uh, my assumption was that she was done with cubs and then she showed up with quadruplets, which just shows you how much I know, right? She's constantly surprising us. Uh, but generally speaking, technically she's fertile till the end of her life. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Do we need to worry about 399 being out of the park again? Well, it's not good. We'd rather have her in the park, certainly. Uh, the amount of conflict between garbage and bird seed and inappropriately stored dog food and roads and highways and traffic and all of those things are definitely things that we don't want to see cause conflict. Uh, the area where she has been hanging out is not an area that traditionally sees grizzly bears, and so folks aren't necessarily going to take the appropriate precautions like people who live in northern Jackson Hole or are used to grizzly bears wandering through their backyards all the time may do. Uh, but where she is right now is a relatively safe area uh, where she's getting the food she needs in preparation for hibernation. So it's not ideal, but it's nothing to panic about. Uh, we're just going to have to take things as they are. And one of the cool things about grizzly bears is they're going to do what they're going to do. They're certainly not going to follow our suggestions and rules on how they should live their lives. That's kind of what makes them really cool. So the fact she's outside of the park just proves she's a grizzly bear, right? She's going to do what she wants. Um, and hopefully people will keep an eye open and, uh, and be smart on the roadways. Luckily, we don't have a lot of uh, traffic this time of year. Just got a little bit of time for just a couple more questions. If 399 would die now, would her cubs survive? Maybe. Quite a few cubs can and do. Uh, it's possible, certainly. It wouldn't be great, but it's certainly possible. So good question there. All right. I think... I think that's all we've got time for. I'm so sorry, guys. If I didn't get to your question, I'll try to get to it in the comment section. Guys, it's been such a pleasure spending this Wednesday with you all. I hope you all have a fantastic week. Don't forget to defrost your turkey early so it's ready for Thanksgiving, something I forget about every year. I, uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend, wild week. You stay safe, and uh, we'll see you all next week. So long.